Welcome everybody to um, our uh, forum today uh, with regards to uh, the title, um, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, will it ever end? And I'm I'm Bill Hefner, for those of you who don't, don't know me, uh, in, uh, in Department of Family Medicine at the Oregon uh, Family Medicine Clinic, and I work with Melissa Stiles in the area of faculty development for community docs. And that was one of our reasons for this forum today is just to address both from a scientific information standpoint what we're working with right now and uh, how we can um, perhaps continue to work through this for the long haul um, and uh, maintain some of the I think uh, foundational principles of our uh, family medicine practice and that is our doctor patient provider patient relationships. So let me introduce John Tempty. I think he needs no introduction as uh, a long-term faculty member with our residency in the Family Medicine Department, as well as now the Associate Dean of Public Health and Community Engagement with the Medical School. And then Julia Yates is joining us as well, who is uh, Director of the FAMWELL Board, um, who really, uh, her passion is wellness and uh, is uh, Director of our Behavioral Health uh, uh, curriculum for our Department of Family Medicine as well. So John will present first, uh, then Julia will present. Please, uh, as uh, your ideas for questions come up, would you place them in the chat function? And then I'll try to uh, then um, lead out with questions once, uh, once we're finished. All right. We'll let uh, Jonathan, you go ahead and, and begin. Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, I'm going to try and share my screen here. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, I think just by way of comparison, uh, Julia is going to be talking about wellness, and I'm going to be talking about the unwellness here. Um, hopefully, you're seeing the screen now. And if someone can let me know if it's up there, Looks good. We can okay. see it. Very good. All right. I'm going to just give some very, very basic information here. And my goal is to provide uh, much more time for questions and answers uh, than on a lot of the information that I think many of us already have a good sense of. So, predictions. Well, as everybody knows, our very first case in Wisconsin showed up by way of transport uh, from Beijing to the Madison Airport on February 5th. And since that time, we have experienced nothing really other than an exponential growth. Uh, we have now hit 15 doublings. Uh, and our doubling time in cases in the cumulative is about 16.3 days. As of yesterday, as you can see here, we had just a really large caseload um, in Wisconsin. So we're up to, um, you know, just a little bit shy of one person out of every thousand, or uh, one person out of every uh do the math right, uh, 10,000 who has been positive, but uh, the, the number of cases out there is really soon going to be at the point where uh, we're overrun. Let me move along here. Unfortunately, uh, even though our death rate hovers around 0.9%, yesterday we hit 92 Wisconsinites dying. And this was, in the, there was a death in a majority of our counties yesterday. And you can see the pattern here that early on we had a fairly significant rise in deaths, basically in April and May, dropping down during the summertime and really accelerating in late September uh, into October and November. On our incidents command uh, call last night, uh, heard that uh, UW and Meritor have actually fairly high caseloads. A number of the patients that used to be managed in the 
intense secure units are managed on the floor with very high flow oxygen. But again, we're uh, coming up toward a point of pretty significant problems within Dane County and also across uh, the upper Midwest and many places throughout the country. Could we see this coming? And I have to go back to one of my very favorite papers on this on April 14th. So keep in mind that is seven months ago. And the folks that were doing modeling uh, through Harvard got it absolutely right. We knew this was coming um, and we didn't do the right things for this. So a little bit of a complicated graphic here, but I just want to go over it very quickly that the blue bar or the blue panel on the uh, graph on the left represents a period of time with fairly intensive public health measures. And the lines you see after that indicate what happens if you had zero reduction in the basic reproductive number of SARS-CoV-2. The red is 20% reduction, 40% reduction in the blue, and 60% reduction in the green. And what you see here is that if you have a really good re reduction in transmission, it does buy you time. But when you relax those efforts, or when your state Supreme Court says you can no longer do these, we end up with an explosion. These are also the figures that model in the seasonality of this virus. We knew back from years ago that the other beta coronaviruses that are in usual circulation are very, very seasonal. And so this modeling took into account what we knew at that time in terms of the transmissibility of this virus, took into account seasonality and other things and predicted that we're going to see a significant rise in the fall and winter. So my prediction for right now is unfortunately things are going to continue to get worse. The other uh, thing that is kind of the good news is if we continue doing the things that will help reduce transmission for SARS-CoV-2, these also work phenomenally well for almost all the other respiratory viruses. My colleagues in Australia saw absolutely no influenza during their winter, and I'm suspecting we're going to see a pretty light influenza season this year. The bad news about that, however, is if we have a very low flu year this year, there's not going to be any of that natural priming of our immune systems, and we might see a, a fairly horrendous influenza season in, in 2021, 2022. All right, so I'm going to switch from predictions to the vaccines. And if you haven't been paying attention to the news media, you wouldn't hear that there are two really good vaccines out there now. The Moderna vaccine uh, on the left-hand column is a two-dose vaccine, 28 days apart. Uh, and this is a more kind vaccine when it comes to storage and handling. It can live in our freezers for up to six months and in the refrigerator, I need to update the slide, it's now extended to 30 days in refrigerator temperature, but it has to be used within six hours of the vial being punctured. The second vaccine, which is kind of ahead of the game in terms of getting to the FDA for review, is the Pfizer-BioNTech, and it's also a messenger RNA vaccine. Is a two-dose injection given 21 days apart. And unfortunately, this is the one that has to be stored at very, very cold temperatures, a minus 70 degrees centigrade. 
And once it's warmed up to a freezer temperature or refrigerator temperature, it has to be used within 24 hours. So this is going to be more of an issue with the storage and handling and distribution. But the good news for both of these vaccines is they're both about 95% effective in terms of preventing COVID-19 disease. We don't know if they have effect on transmission or not, or becoming infected, but we do know that if you have symptoms and you're tested, uh, it reduces the likelihood of being uh, infected with this virus and having symptoms by 95%, which is phenomenal. They both appear to be relatively safe. Now, I just want to mention very quickly some ideas in terms of the balance of immunity and vulnerability and thinking about the herd effect. The herd effect is really a multiplier with vaccinating one person protecting more than that one person. And we can actually plot this out looking at the percent of a population that's immune uh, either through infection and recovery or by vaccine. And it turns out that for uh, this particular virus, anywhere from about 55 to 70 percent is a good estimate of the herd immunity or the immunity needed to protect kind of the whole population and make this virus go away. Now, when I think about this, I think about this is for, you know, just a theoretical situation. But if we need a 65 percent immunity across our population to get to this herd threshold, and let's say 15 percent of us, by the time we have a vaccine, have been naturally immunized by infection and recovery, that leaves about 50 percent to be made up for with vaccine. And to get there, we have to look at the vaccine effectiveness and the vaccine coverage. So in this theoretical situation, if you had a 70% effective vaccine and 70% of the population accepted the vaccine, you get there. Now, the good news with both of these vaccines being 90 to 95% effective, it means we don't have to vaccinate as many people as we would have needed had this been a vaccine that had 60 or 70 percent uh, efficacy. So right now, we still need approximately 60 percent of our population to receive this vaccine and receive it properly and receive two doses to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And unfortunately, this is not going to come quickly, but we may have some doses available in Wisconsin by the end of January, or by the end of December, I'm sorry. And the first tier, uh, our phase 1A, will be healthcare providers. So the state has a uh, subcommittee of the State Disaster Medical Advisory Committee that's working on vaccine allocation. Uh, I have the joy of uh, co-chairing that along with Ann Lewandowski from the uh, uh, Rural Wisconsin Hospital Cooperative. And we're working desperately right now to get our allocation procedure down so we have fair and equitable and evidence-based distribution and application of the vaccine. Now, when we start talking about population effects, this has been going on for a long time. And one of the biggest things that we deal with, unfortunately, is the fear. For example, watching the news this morning, they were showing the aisles of various groceries and other department stores being stripped, uh, toilet paper, paper towel, uh, things like uh, chicken and flour. There's fear out there. We're all suffering from the COVID fatigue, and Julia might be able to pick up on this, but we're finding now uh, that people who have had COVID have a significant 
about a 20% risk of developing a new mental health diagnosis within 90 days of that initial diagnosis. But there's also the fatigue. And the thing that really is bothersome with this entire pandemic has been the, or the misinformation, the threats, and the lies out there. And I just uh, put up the picture of the person running our task force uh, asking in a tweet for people to rise up in Michigan against the governor's request for a mask mandate. This is just so inappropriate, but we've been dealing with this since the beginning. I'm gonna just finish up here with a brief mention on metrics. And as you're all aware, the metrics just don't seem to apply anymore. Um, these are the metrics from Madison Dane County Public Health for the forward Dane. These were updated last on the 12th of November. And more than anything, we're just being overrun by cases per day. Uh, we cannot keep up with the contact tracing. Uh, and some of the other metrics, you know, look like they're okay. And for example, in terms of tests conducted, in terms of healthcare workers being able to be tested and so on. But we can watch around us as our hospitals fill up, as our hospital employees, our nurses, our uh, techs, our respiratory therapists become infected and get pulled out of circulation. And the bottom line is from, despite the fact we have the hope of a vaccine, it's really essential for all of us to be maintaining the social distancing, the masking, the aggressive use of hand hygiene, staying away from other people when we're sick, you know, getting tested, if we're positive, isolating, if we're exposed to people, quarantining. And all I can say is if we follow this, these public health measures, they can be 100% effective. We know this from New Zealand. We know this from Australia. We know this from China. We know this in areas that these procedures have been used and this virus has gone away in the absence of therapeutics and in the absence of vaccine. So over the next uh, two or three or four months until we have more and more vaccine coming out, we're gonna to have to maintain this really well. And even beyond, once we start vaccinating, we're gonna to have to continue this for a number of months. And this will be my lead in to Julia talking about the resiliency, the wellness, and all those other important things that we're gonna to have to employ to get through the uh, COVID fatigue, uh, the pandemic fatigue, and all the other stuff that we're, you know, desperately dealing with right now in terms of social isolation, in terms of change in our usual habits, and uh, absence of many of the pleasurable things we used to do. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, I don't know, Bill, if you want to do questions now, or if you want to just move on to the second part here. John, uh, thank you. I, I think what we'll do, I'd like to make sure that Julia gets uh, her time to present to us. And I'm asking uh, everyone, as, as I'm doing right now, to please start uh, putting your questions in for John and Julia both. So we'll have time to do uh, both of it. So thank you. All right, Julia, we'll let you go ahead and proceed with your Great, thoughts. Everybody. Uh, Nice to see everyone this morning. I am hopefully sharing my screen. Let me just get that locked and loaded. Um, and yeah, I almost just want to give us a moment to take a breath, but we're going to do that a little bit in, in what we're about to talk about too, and just digest some of that information that John gave us, because I am going to shift gears a little bit for us. And, you know, John was mentioning COVID fatigue, and I'm going to talk about a lot of kind of fatigue this morning, but I thought I'd start with one that maybe is a little less emotionally laden, and that's muscle fatigue. You know, this concept of I just cannot do one more, you know, when when I do push ups and you get to that point where your muscle is actually giving out. I I literally can't do another one in this moment. And I was thinking to myself. That actually doesn't mean that I will never do a push-up again. It doesn't mean I have lost my ability to do push-ups. 
It doesn't mean that if I don't give myself a break, it won't come back to me. And in fact, a break is exactly probably what I need if I actually want to get to that six push-up. And I want us to keep that in mind when we're thinking about empathy and compassion fatigue. I'm going to get a little spoiler here. There, there's some debate in the literature, actually, about whether it is empathy fatigue we are experiencing or compassion fatigue we are experiencing. And I'll let you chew on that a little bit because first I just want to go over the definitions of what is empathy, what is compassion. And these are these are my definitions with a whole lot of Kristen Neff kind of in there and a, a little bit of a little bit of shake of Brene Brown. Um, but I'm referencing Kristen Neff on this slide as well, um, just because she's got a great website. Um, but empathy, empathy is when we are taking on the perspective and connecting with the feelings of another. And quite frankly, to do that, we are also getting really into touch with our emotions and our feelings. And for, in, in order for me to imagine or feel with you, I have to make myself open to that emotional experience too. So empathy, I, I really do like to think of it as emotional resonance. You know, we're feeling with. And the goal of empathy is understanding. Let, let me connect with you. Let me understand you. Compassion is different. And compassion is what arises in you when you are faced with another suffering. And I, I know that is happening for us all over the place right now. And then, and then you feel motivated. You feel motivated to do something about that suffering. You may or may not actually be tapping into a whole lot of your emotions, but you are feeling motivated to help, to heal, and to, and to fix, to be quite frank. And that is, this is awareness that is action-oriented. That is compassion. That is what I see in so many of my peers and my colleagues and friends that, that wanting to help. And you can probably see where I'm going here and that, hmm, what happens though? What happens when I'm showing up in the space, you know, and I want to help and my empathy is there and I, I can't, you know, I am dealing with a pandemic. I am overwhelmed. I, there is so much out there. What happens is our empathy gets tired. So you're getting my bias. I tend to agree with Kristen Neff. I tend to agree with some folks out there that it is truly our empathy that is fatiguing. I cannot do one more empathy push-up in this moment. And I like this definition of empathy fatigue, which is also kind of a bunch mixed together, in that empathy fatigue is being constantly exposed to suffering including our own. That's where that empathy piece comes in. I'm aware of your suffering, which is actually making me feel my own as well. And I can't do a dang thing about it. I am not able to show up the way I want to. I'm not able to help the way I want to. That is what I know I'm feeling. I know a lot of us are feeling. It is making our empathy tired. And so in other words, and these really are my words, if you've heard me say this before, we are feeling all of the feels and we are not able to move to action like we want to. And that is going to fatigue all of our empathy. And this is where I want us to go back to that concept of muscle fatigue. You know, I, I recently was talking with someone and this really brave actually individual shared with me that they feel like they've lost their empathy. I've lost it, it's not, it's, it's gone. And that made me think of this, you know, no, it's not gone, it's tired, you know, it's. We need a rest. You probably need a rest. I need a rest when I, re when I notice that my empathy is fatiguing. And that, that can show up in a lot of different ways. That can be that I'm, I'm going numb. I'm, I'm not really feeling. That could be I'm overly feeling. Everything feels raw, but I am not connecting and I feel tired. Now, what do we need in that moment? You know, what do we need when my empathy is fatigued? I think this is hard for a lot of us to say out loud and a lot of us to hear is that we probably need to pause. We probably need to stop in that moment, which we are not conditioned to do as healers and as healthcare clinicians, and ask, wow, I don't think I can do another empathy push-up in this moment. What do I need? And I want to encourage you to ask yourself that because that is, that is different 
for every single person, every single one of us out there. There is no one size fits all for this resiliency building that we need, this practice that's going to help us keep going. You know, for, for someone, it might be a breath in this moment. For someone else, it might mean I need to go outside and scream. You know? For someone, I might need to cry. I very recently had someone else say, you know, I, I, finally, I finally let myself cry. And actually, that's what I needed. Yeah. Lately, you know, a little bit of levity, I have been breaking into random dance, kind of like Christopher Walken in that music video. But, you know, sometimes I feel like I just got to step away and move my body a little bit. So if one thing you can take from me this afternoon is to pause, notice, and ask yourself, what do I need? And if that is drawing a blank for folks, because I get this is not a natural question for, the, for, for most of us, we're used to asking it the other way, I would encourage you to think about the BBC, which is not the British uh, broadcasting company, um, although I like that too. Uh, there is a lot of evidence. You know, when we look at the well being literature, there is a lots of evidence behind the BBC, which is the first part is breath. Yeah. We need to collectively and individually find moments to come back to our breath. You know, I, I heard a quote, I don't even remember where I heard this from, but that moment when you feel like, oh my gosh, I don't even have time to breathe is the exact moment you absolutely need a breath. And I wanna give us a practice um, this afternoon really quickly um, because it's one of our most basic forms of biofeedback. Um, and that's ratio breathing. And ratio breathing is simply extending the exhale. You know, most of the folks who have maybe worked with me have done this with me before. We've talked about pushing the exhale. And what that does is it takes us from our sympathetic fight or flight state and maybe just for a moment, right? Just for 30 seconds, helps us tap back into that parasympathetic resting state, even if it's just for a moment. And so what we do here is we inhale and make our exhale longer. And you can play with that ratio. I tend to like four in, a breath in for four, and a breath out for six. And so I, I have lost my ability to see all you lovely folks out there, but I thought we would just practice this really quickly. And so I'm gonna collectively invite us to take a breath in for four, and then extend your exhale for six. And just one more time, a breath in for four on your own count. And extend your exhale for six. And just take a moment to notice in that little bit of time. Maybe there was a, just a tiny shift for you. Now, the next part of our BBC is it's a break, you know, and that might mean I need a 30 second break before I go on. I just need before I go into this next exam room, I need to pause before I do this. I just need this minute. That might be a longer break that we have to schedule at a different time. That maybe I need to give myself a Friday somewhere down the road and that's OK. That might be a media break. I, when I get home tonight, I am not checking my phone or Twitter or any of those things because I am fatigued and I can feel it and I need a break. You have my permission right now in whatever way you can, it's whatever way you need to find a way to give yourself those little breaks. And then the last part of the BBC, in, in this way anyway, is here's that word compassion again. Not necessarily that it's fatiguing for us, but actually maybe it can be what helps when our empathy is fatiguing. So this is not gonna be compassion turned outward when we are helping somebody else. It's can we turn that compassion inward? Can we bring it to ourselves? And that, that's not easy. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just gonna be very real when we talk about that. You know, when I say, can we be kind? I almost wanted that to be dot, dot, dot. Oh yeah, and to ourselves. Because I know for me, you know, I, you know, I tend to be kinder to almost everyone else in my world, whether that's friends or family or, you know, stranger on street. I would never say some of the things to my friends and family or stranger on the street that I 
somewhat regularly say to myself. And so I do invite folks to think about that, to notice that, you know, and what's my self-talk like inward? Am I being kind to myself? And when I think about compassion, I, I, I like to break it down this way. And so does Kristen Neff. So I have quoted her a couple of times. So you will see on the slides, there's a link to her website that has a lot of this practices, short and brief practices that you can do for compassion. But when we think about compassion, there's three components. And that first component that I want to share with folks this morning, this afternoon, is that we need to acknowledge the suffering. That's not easy to do. You know, we don't we don't necessarily have a culture that supports us in acknowledging suffering and just saying this is hard. Not changing it, not sugarcoating it, not putting it in a bow. This is hard. I would encourage you to practice saying that out loud. You know, or you can use my mantra there or you can come up with your own one, but some way that helps you acknowledge the suffering, not changing it, not minimizing it not making it less, not making it more, but this is hard. And this, this next piece, if we get existential for a minute, is that suffering is part of life. It's not wrong. It's incredibly painful. It is not easy, but it, it's what makes us humans. Hard happens is my mantra there. And you know, really when we break that down, it, it does, and it's difficult. And often we hear of the phenomenon of post-traumatic stress, right? We hear of that. But there's an equally, if not more prevalent phenomenon of post-traumatic growth. It doesn't get a lot of press sometimes. It's getting more and more. But this concept is that we grow in pain. We connect in pain. You know, when, we're, when we acknowledge the pain, don't try to shift it or movement. There's growth and strength there. And so that's something I come back to sometimes when I'm quite overwhelmed myself. This is hard. Hard happens. And then the last part of compassion that I want to invite us to think about today is that very moment where we can bring the kindness inward. In that moment, when you recognize that maybe your empathy is fatiguing, maybe you did not show up in that, I'll speak for myself, when I have got shown up in a patient interaction the way I wanted to, when I know I didn't give it my all, when I know that I was distracted, when I know I was frustrated, all of that happens to me. And instead of what's wrong with me, why can't I change that? I've been practicing saying, you know what? It's okay to be human. It's okay to not be okay. And letting ourselves have that, that what would I say to my best friend in that moment? What would I say to my child or my sibling? What would I say to a stranger on the street? I probably wouldn't say some of the harsh things we often say to ourselves. So recognizing this practice, acknowledging suffering, suffering happens, can I be kind to myself? And so I want to move us along because I'm wondering if there are folks out there thinking, yes, I, I get that. I can resonate with that. I can, you know, there is, I, I feel the empathy fatigue. But it's not, it's not all me, you know, it's just not, it's not all internal. And I guess I want to be really transparent and say, no, you know, it's not. And this got me thinking about two things, two phenomenons that we're hearing a lot of in the well-being literature right now. And that's burnout, which I probably won't spend a lot of time on because we, we talk about that. That is that emotional fatigue. We're talking about that. It is that depersonalization and exhaustion. You know, one that rings true for me, that losing that sense of personal accomplishment, like, am I, am, does this even matter? Am I having an impact? We're feeling that in this pandemic right now. And that, yeah, we feel that. And it's internal. But then there's something else, this concept of, okay, but what if it's not me? And there was a recent article that I've shared with lots of folks in JAMA about actually healthcare clinicians have pretty high levels of resiliency. We, we start out as pretty resilient people and we tend to maintain some of that resilience and yet we're still really struggling. What's going on? And that takes us to this concept of moral injury, which I'm, I'm thinking folks have heard and have looked into and have seen out there. And moral injury, this concept has been around for a while. You know, we started looking at that with, with specifically Vietnam veterans, but looking at, you know, the impact of war on a personal psyche. And, you know, so I have a definition there that I think is 
we can wrap our brain around, you know, moral injury is when we are part of, or we fail to prevent, or we see acts that go against our moral compass, who we are, you know, our sense, our core beliefs. And what, what folks are really finding right now is, well, this is happening in healthcare on lots of reasons. Before the pandemic, it was happening in healthcare, but certainly now I think this is palpable and we're feeling it. So there's a, an article I, that I, I found really helpful, um, but this was their definition of moral injury in healthcare. And that's the challenge of knowing how to care for patients, what patients need, how we wanna show up, not being able to do it because there are things outside of us that are not in our control, beyond us, like a pandemic and like challenging systems and all of those things that actually produce a sense of moral injury, which turns out does impact burnout. It's not one or the other. We can actually experience both. And so I would be curious, I actually, when you're presenting like this, you lose the chat box, um, but I was actually gonna have folks think about that and just shout out and I'll be able to see it later. You know, what does moral injury in healthcare mean to you? You know, this is one definition from three researchers out there, but I, I would be curious um, and save some time to talk about that. What are you experiencing? What does that mean to you? So if folks are willing right now to throw that in chat, what is moral injury? What does that look like? How are you experiencing that? I'll be eager to read that when I can see the chat box again, but feel free to put that into chat. Because I want to I want to close today a couple more things that I want to make sure that I share with you and I want to bring this top of mind and that okay how, but what what can we do you know first I just I have been so humbled and honored in our department and there's too many names to name when you see people out there advocating you know one of the things about moral injury when we see it you know when it's external what do we do is we advocate you know, we we go out and do things. We make our voices heard. And so many examples of that happening in our department and in different ways. And that is one way to start chipping away at systems that aren't serving us and advocating for what we need in this current pandemic. And that's going to take a while. And in the meantime, a lot of us are experiencing empathy fatigue as well. And so I want to give you this concept that comes right out of my whole health work. So a shout out out there. If there are folks out there on the line who are fellow whole health educators with me, this goes to Adam and Marate and all of our work out of integrative medicine. I have the privilege of being able to teach whole health. And when I am, this is absolutely my most meaningful thing to teach about. And that is our map. One thing that can help us hang on is reconnecting with our map. So that's your, your personal meaning, aspiration, and purpose. Yeah, what, what matters to you? And I wanna take a moment, I'm gonna check my phone to make sure I'm not going too over on time, but I'm gonna only give you about two minutes, so this isn't going to be too long. But I wanna take a moment to invite you to think this way. So my question to you is, what is your origin story? What brought you to this line of work? What brought you to healthcare? You know, what is or was your healthcare calling? And I'm, I'm actually going to give us a couple of minutes to just write on that. You know, if that's on your computer, if that's a piece of paper you have, but just take a few moments to tap into your map. And as, as you're thinking, I'm just going to let you know I'm, this is not going to be a large share because I, I want this to be so personal for you. I want this to be something you can come back to. Because here's the truth that I find about our origin stories is they're complicated, you know, and they, they're they real. And, you know, I, I'll share, since I'm asking y'all to think about this a little bit, when people ask me, you know, why did you become a therapist? I give an answer, which is true, often, a very kind of a surface answer that is, well, I really like to help people. But my, my deeper origin story is growing up in a family with severe and persistent mental illness. And, you know, tapping into that for me about how that shaped my path can be really empowering. So let me just give you a minute. I'm going to stop talking for you to write, think, connect with what is your origin story. Don't worry, I'm timing up.
And as you're thinking on that, we're going to wrap up any writing that folks are doing in about 30 seconds. I'm, I, I want to offer if anyone would want to share. Um, that's certainly a big share. Um, so, but I'll give a couple moments if anyone would like to just put words in this space about what is your origin story? What brought you to this line of work? What brought you to healthcare? Please keep thinking on that. And I, I just encourage you to come back to that. I can encourage you to maybe even spend a little bit more time in a more private space today. I'm thinking about that. Yeah, how, how did I get here? What was my path here? And coming back to that. And I wanna save a lot of time for questions. So I, I'm gonna close with something that I, I, I hope is a little provocative, <laughs> is maybe a little like shake this up a little bit. And that's, that's the shadow side of positivity. I, I'm going to, I'm just my day to confess to lots and lots of people out there, but sometimes when I hear be positive, try to be positive, it makes me cringe a little bit inside because I don't always think that's what we need, to be quite honest. And, you know, we talk a lot, especially in my world, about the irrational side of negativity, right? Irrational negativity. We don't want that. No. But there's an irrational positivity as well. You know, this forced positivity, this need to be positive, when actually what we probably need, what will heal us most in terms of empathy fatigue and acknowledging moral injury and what we can do and connecting back with our map is not positive. It's real. It's authentic. It's what's actually going on. And I think there's a lot in, you know, in our society where we are, there is this need to sort of push uncomfortability away. Okay, well, well, can you make that more positive? Could you put a bow on that? Because that's uncomfortable. When what we really need to do is lean in to these healthy, accurate, rational, real, but painful feelings. They're not wrong. They just hurt. And so one of the, there's a practice I want to leave you with and lots of folks out there have done this with me. This comes out of Sharon Salzberg's work, but this is a practice called RAIN. And I would encourage you the next time that there's an emotion there for you, that's real strong. It's, it's just present, right? It's banging on your door. I want you to practice this. First, the R in RAIN is to just simply recognize that emotion. What is this? What am I feeling? You know, maybe it's dread, maybe it's fear, maybe it's joy. Maybe it's anger, but name it. Give this emotion a name. And then once you've named this emotion, once you've recognized it, simply acknowledging it, right? Not changing it. If it's a nice one, not if it's a pleasurable one, it's not trying to hang on to it and get more of it. If it is one of those painful ones, it's not trying to push it away or change it or feel bad for feeling it. It's simply acknowledge the presence of this emotion. You know, for me, I, I sometimes just envision like here I am waving at anxiety. Hello, anxiety. I see you. There you are. Yes. And it's not allowing. It's not accepting, especially if it's painful. It's just acknowledging. And that gives us space to investigate. And that's the I in RAIN. Why is this emotion showing up for me? Oh, because I'm exhausted and I care. And I'm in the midst of something that's never happened before. It makes sense that I'm afraid or that I'm scared or that I'm overwhelmed investigate, go in, why is this emotion coming up to me? And maybe one step further, I sometimes like to think of our emotions as little lassie dogs kind of coming to tell us that Timmy is in the well. You know, what is this emotion trying to tell me? What might I learn from this emotion if I can sit next to it? And then last and close, the last part of RAIN is this concept of this, your emotions are not you. Now, our language actually does not a great job of that, right? We say, I am sad. I am scared. I want you to try this out, though. It's just saying this to yourself. I'm experiencing sadness. I'm experiencing fear. Because that's, that's what it is. And when we do that, you almost feel the space, right? Well, okay, I'm experiencing fear. Here it is. It's not overtaking me. It doesn't have to overtake me. It's sitting next to me. And can I learn from it, acknowledge it, and it will go away and another feeling will come in, but can I just make space for it? 
So that is a practice that I want to leave you with when positivity is not what we need, when real is what we need. And I'm going to close things there and stop sharing my screen so that we can probably open it up to all kinds of questions. And also just say thank you for thank you for inviting me to show up in your space this way. And if anything I talked about today resonated and you'd like to say see more, please shoot me an email. Stay in touch. I'm happy to talk more about this one on one or in groups. So thank you. Well, thank you, Julia, very much. Um, I appreciate your thoughts. Appreciate uh, reevaluating my. Uh, my sense of moral injury right now in light of origin, in light of what uh, really uh, uh, makes my my clock tick and my mind work in, in medicine right now. So, John, we'll start with you, the question, and then I think I'll try to alternate between you and Julia some. Um, John, a question came in. Um, do you have any sense uh, how long the immunity might last with the vaccines because these phased trials were, you know, only for six to eight months or so. Um, and because usual immunity, I think you've said in the past, induced by uh, coronaviruses in the community usually didn't last very long. A, a wonderful question for which there is no good answer, uh, given that the first person diagnosed with this uh, viral disease uh, has been living one year since that diagnosis, uh, November 17th uh, in Wuhan uh, of 2019. What we do know, uh, there's a pre-publication paper out of Scripps uh, Institute of Immunology indicating that the vex or that immunity may last longer than we were originally thinking. Uh, several months, and the hope is that it might be as long as a year. That's despite the fact that there are some individuals who have absolute confirmation of reinfection uh, with this virus after having uh, a significant earlier case. There are individuals who have a second infection that's milder, but we also have individuals who have a second infection which is more severe. So the immunology really needs to be worked out. And when we start talking about vaccine-induced immunity, uh, the longest vaccinated person is somebody who was initially immunized in June. And so we just don't have really good information about the longevity. Suffice to say, I think most of us are thinking that the immunity is gonna last uh, several months, uh, uh, maybe up to a year but that revaccination in the future may be a requirement every year, every two years. Um, John, thank you. And along that same line, a question came in that, um, you know, you mentioned natural immunity um, due to past infection in this pandemic. Um, is it known now that reinfection is not going to be really the issue or do we still need to be mindful of that possibility? I think we have to be mindful. Uh, we, when I say we, uh, along with a uh, medical student, we looked at all of our data from previously collected seasonal coronaviruses uh, from our study of school children, from uh, our surveillance in the DFM clinics, and from a long term care study. And it turns out that the four seasonal coronaviruses occur across the entire age span. And because they're very ubiquitous, one has, has to assume that people in their 80s who are getting this have gotten this several times in the past. Unfortunately, what we also find is that regardless of age, uh, about half of these infections lead to flu-like illnesses, so with a fever. So the take-home message is the other coronaviruses allow people to get reinfected throughout their lifetime, and they continue to have pretty significant symptomology with them. So I think one has to assume that the SARS virus is likely to be open, at least to reinfection. We just don't know the, the timing uh, or whether or not people will be as sick or have a lesser illness if that happens. 
John, one more for you. Um, question is, uh, do you have a sense of how vaccines will be allocated to the states and is it being coordinated um, or are we fending for ourselves um, sort of like the PPE issue sort of came about? Yeah, I, I think this is going to be better coordinated. Uh, you'll have certain uh, buckets of vaccines. So the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs will have a bucket of their own for distribution. The Indian Health Service will have a bucket for distribution uh, amongst uh, tribal nations. And then uh, uh, we're looking at probably a prorated uh, based on population allocation to each of the uh, states. Uh, once it gets to the states, that's what we're working on right now in terms of how do we allocate between health systems and once the health system has it, how do they allocate within their uh, people that they have responsibility to vaccinate? That being said, uh, I think across all jurisdictions, the very first people in line for vaccine are going to be healthcare personnel. And we've put together for the state of Wisconsin some considerations that entities can use to try and prioritize between individuals. For example, if there's somebody who is doing an aerosol generating procedure, you should be considered much higher risk than the person who's not. Um, if you're working on a COVID unit, uh, you're at higher risk than somebody is, that's not. But we're allowing a great deal of flexibility with uh, within entities to make their own decisions which are best for them, as long as they're adhering to the first uh, phase of healthcare personnel. Uh, following that is going to be essential personnel, essential workers, and high-risk individuals, and it will ratchet on down from there. But I think this is all going to unfold, uh, at least the very first phase, relatively quickly, and then be uh, moved or brought on out over the next several months uh, until we can start vaccinating everybody. Uh, Julia, um, question for you. I hope you've been able to see the chat now and some yeah. of the, some of the information that people have put in in terms of moral injury for them. But I thought I would ask you, and if it's all right, to also ask some of our family practice statesmen who are on the call, John Beasley, Bill Schwab, to maybe also weigh in on this issue of mm -hmm. the assault, it seems, on our doctor provider patient relationship in recent years, but also now, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic, where, you know, I, I personally struggle that I can't follow my patients into the hospital, nor can their families, you know, um, very isolating. Uh, we can't see them in our nursing homes. Um, and it seems that so much of my knowledge of patients is not in real time anymore, it's virtual. So when we add the PPE barriers and turning away patients from our clinics because they have possible COVID-19 disease symptoms, uh, I, I guess I would like to ask you to address that in terms of this sense of moral injury that I think we're beginning to feel more of in family medicine, particularly where we value this doctor, provider, patient relationship. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I'll give my thoughts on that and then open this up. But, you know, I, I think what we're seeing and the first thing that came to my mind is yet yeah, we're grieving, you know, that with, part of moral injury is a grieving process. And, you know, I think we've intuitively known this, right? And you, you, many of you heard have heard me say that the relationship centered care, that relationships aren't just nice. They're not just fluff. They're not just a means to an end. They absolutely are the intervention and they're symbiotic. Mm -hmm. It's not just what we are relating to the patients, but what we get back. And I think what we're experiencing right now with COVID and the barriers, I just experienced this when I was in, you know, clinic on Monday and all of the barriers is that we are not connecting, you know, how we want to. And we are not able to do that. And it is not our fault. It's not something we're doing. We're trying to be safe. But the cost of that safety is this relationship. And that is hard. And, you know, that is part of moral injury. And that is why that is not like, you know, something that we can just sort of self-talk our way out of. It is a grief process that we are experiencing right now. We have to allow ourselves to know that this is hard. I don't feel like I can connect. I feel sad. I feel disconnected. 
And what I would say to you, all of those are the healthy emotions that we would feel when we're grieving this relationship. I am hopeful that this will come back. This is, you know, that we will not be in PPE forever, as John's telling us, and that we will then be able to connect like we used to. But there's this nugget in from in there for me that is powerful in knowing, gosh, we were really connecting before. All of that was not just in print. These relationships were real. And we are starting to grieve that because we can't access that the way we did. I do believe we will again, but I think right now it's okay to grieve that. So let me pause there just to see if there's other folks that would like to weigh in too. Well, Jen, Bill, since you since you asked this, Bill Schwab, I'll just say that I I take Julia's point totally about the grief. And I also share with it the gratitude. And there there's that. And the gratitude is I can see to people's safety. And that's mm -hmm. my priority. And I don't want them in unsafe situations. And I'm appreciative even of the clunky technology we have because I could at least do that much. So I, I'm gra grateful for that. I'm totally with you, Bill, that that personal and long-term relationship is hugely meaningful. And I'm also grateful for the teams that I work with and uh, the, the notion that um, not only are they very good at what they do, but I respect their values. I respect their approach. I respect their commitment. I feel like the people I care for are being cared for, which means I have to give up some feelings of control in that because I have them uh, and that's a grief. But at the same time, I'm going to go with the gratitude for it, too. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm willing to find the balance in that because the imperatives are that we must. But at the same time, like everyone else, I feel wounded by it uh, in dealing with it as well. Well, thank you, Bill and Julia, both. Um, for those uh, those thoughts, uh, that's helpful to me personally. Um, John, a question for you um, uh, came up: Should we be testing healthcare workers, all healthcare workers, periodically, like uh, is being done at you know sporting events and nursing homes, for instance? Well, to put things in reference, all the residential UW students are being tested weekly. Uh, at this point in time, and some dorms are being tested twice a week. And that seems to be a relatively effective way to control an outbreak, uh, at least on a UW campus, that in a perfect world, we would have been testing all of our faculty, uh, or all our MD faculty, all the nurses, all, all staff on a weekly basis going way back. That would have uh, helped with a lot of problems. However, there just wasn't testing available at that time. Uh, as time goes on, we're going to have more testing uh, available. I, I have to chuckle a little bit because currently the cost of a PCR being done uh, commercially in Madison is about 100 bucks a shot. And um, that the, the amount of expenditure is just astronomic. But uh, up until but what the UW hospital doesn't have the capacity to uh, do its own staff, uh, even though they have a fully functional uh, laboratory there. So it really does provide a or create a lot of uh, challenges. The UW campus is now opening up uh, for testing. There is a West Campus facility in Nielsen uh, tennis facility that is able to do a lot of testing using a rapid test, uh, a 15 minutes uh, called the Binax Now. And it would be wonderful to have healthcare providers tested at least weekly, if not more frequently. But the consideration that goes in is whether or not people are given time to walk out of the hospital to the testing center, wait there and come back. I've been told that, well, this would, maybe work for the MD faculty, but not for the nursing staff. So there's a, a great deal of disparity. There's a great deal of lack of coordination. And there's been just a, a great deal of lack of testing capacity. Uh, as time goes on, I think this is going to get better and better. Uh, manufacturers are coming out with uh, home test kits that uh, people can collect their own specimen and do the testing at home. Uh, the current ones are uh, still under uh, requirement for a physician prescription. Uh, we're hoping to see in the near future uh, over-the-counter uh, test kits like that that tend to be relatively cheap 
But I think until you have an abundance of really cheap and really highly functional testing, we're going to be in a continuation of some of the problems we're in right now. Thanks, John. You described the vaccines as relatively safe. Um, and what are the chances, maybe with past experience with vaccines, that the administration to a larger population group that we might see adverse effects that would result, unfortunately, in pausing the immunization well, process? Yeah, unfortunately, absolutely, you'll see events occur after vaccination. Um, I, I say unfortunately because oftentimes the events that occur after vaccination are not causally related whatsoever. Uh, but the news media does a very, very good job of picking this up and uh, uh, various forces out there have a really uh, good success of, at amplifying this. And by the time the science is done to show there's no uh, causation, the damage has already been done. So I'm going to say it's going to be about 100% likelihood that we start seeing things like that once the vaccines start rolling out. Whether or not their uh, causation um, will be up in the air. That being said, if you look at the two vaccines coming out right now before FDA or that are going to be submitted, uh, one is a 44,000 person trial, the other is a 30,000 person trial, which in the vaccine world is enormous. These are huge trials uh, and have a higher likelihood of identifying at least a common pattern of uh, adversity. And from the trials so far, they're not seeing anything like that. Uh, so uh, I, I would, given what I know right now, I'd have no trouble rolling up my sleeve and, and uh, uh, getting vaccinated with either of the Moderna or the Pfizer products. Uh, that being said, we do know that a lot of people will have uh, uh, a response, you know, in the first 24 to 48 hours with fatigue, fever, uh, achiness, and so on. And the, the best way to explain that is that messenger RNA is getting incorporated um, into your cells and you're producing a huge amount of the spike protein and it's really amping up your immune system. So that, that's the good news, that the best way to spin the, the effect you're going to get after the vaccine. But everything I'm seeing uh, is looking favorable in terms of both the safety and the efficacy of these uh, really new platforms for vaccines. Well, thanks, John. That was helpful to put that in perspective in terms of the size of those trials. and. Um... And I think that's that's very helpful to me in terms of uh, safety. Um, I guess the one more for you, John, um, was with regards to um, it says uh, just in general, an asymptomatic patient with known COVID positive exposure. What is the ideal time to advise them to get tested at Alliant or another site? Yeah, I, I'd say probably in that five to seven days after. Uh, exposures, the, well, well you, it, it's a loaded question because there is a public health answer and then there is a laboratory answer. And if your goal is to get a positive result, um, I, I'd shoot for five to seven days when you uh, are most likely to have the highest viral load. Uh, unfortunately, uh, from infection to uh, positivity might be as little as two days. Uh, or it could be as long as, you know, 14 days. So I, I think we have to keep that in mind. But if you're playing the odds, I'd go probably five days or so. Julia, uh, in looking at the uh, chat, um, do you have any uh, response to some of the um, issues that were brought up by people with regards to uh, this quote moral injury, well, I was just reading through that and yeah. just that it makes sense. And I'm just thank you for putting your words there. Thank you for putting your honest, you know, reactions to that. And I, you know, it, we need to talk about this. And I think 
for me, I the goal for me today was to come about this from a multiple angles. And I think moral injury is a really powerful way to look at this. Um, you know, it, it doesn't make it easier, but it sometimes makes it a little bit digestible to say, yeah, you know, this this is why this hurts so much. And, you know, everybody's experience with moral injury will be slightly different. And this is where we actually can support each other in advocating and defining it and what it is for us. And so I just I guess I just want to say thank you for putting some really honest and really needed words in the chat. I I appreciate that as well. Uh, John. Um, Briefly, how about the AstraZeneca vaccine, perhaps, and um, what uh, sort of knowledge do you have also on the Eli Lilly um, vaccine as well? Well, I think the Eli Lilly is the uh, um, unclonal antibody that none of us can pronounce, oh. so I'm not going to even try it. Excuse um, me, I'm sorry, yeah. And there is an allotment for the state of Wisconsin, about 2,400 doses. Uh, when we talked with the incident uh, control or command uh, last night, uh, it has not started flowing yet, uh, but there is uh, through the, uh, the state disaster Advi medical advisory committee, a protocol for distribution. Uh, it's basically a distribution based on um, population with some adjustment for uh, social uh, disparity. Uh, in terms of the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, which, and there's also uh, the Johnson Johnson, these are both uh, adenovirus vectored vaccines. They're not replicating viruses, uh, but has have this spike protein RNA inserted into their genome, so they're coated with the SARS spike protein. Uh, these are quite a bit behind the two mRNA in terms of clinical trials. Both the trials were suspended uh, uh, because of safety signals. Uh, they have now resumed, but we're going to see data from those much later. And uh, the trials are designed that they have certain uh, interim points that they will unblind. At least a statistician will be unblinded and take a look at whether or not they're seeing any uh, uh, effect. And so uh, we haven't reached those points with either of these vaccines. So. Um, the quick answer is nobody knows. We're uh, we're drawing to the end of our time uh, here, but um, Julia, one question that came in um, was just with regards to again, as you saw there, with regards to empathy fatigue and and burnout, um, and sort of uh, parsing those two out. What is the difference between the two? Yeah, the great question. And you really empathy fatigue is a part of burnout. Um, and so I, I, for me, it's what's it's very palpable. It's when I sort of feel it. So when we're that having that sense of either I'm disconnecting, I'm going numb or I'm overreacting, I'm feeling all the feels that actually is an indicator that, you know, I'm, I'm kind of leaning into that direction. And it's also an alert that, yeah, I might need to go inward and take care of myself a little bit and give myself some self care and connect with my map and all of the things we talked about today. But that's an excellent question, uh, but really get it a part of burnout. Okay. Um, John, the last one was with regards to um, transmission from a person who is previously or has been previously COVID positive. If they're exposed again and reinfection does not occur, is there a risk of asymptomatic transmission? <laughs> Yeah. Is there a possibility? Yeah. Is it very high? No, it's, it's very, very low. So I wouldn't worry so much about that. I, I think right now, for most people, you know, we have in the uh, literature a handful of cases of reinfection, but that seems to be the rarity not the, or the exception, not the uh, routine things we find. So uh, at, at this point in time, I would consider being infected and in recovery as at least a pretty good marker that you're uh, not going to be infecting somebody later on. As long as you're getting beyond those 10 days after uh, your first test positive, at which time you should be in isolation and then, then you can resume and not worry too much about anything. And as with everything I've said, uh, it's all likely to change as we start learning more. Uh, the last I checked in the literature, this is now a month ago, there were over 70,000 uh, PubMed 
citations on SARS-CoV-2 uh, coming from January until now. So this is something that the evidence is changing on an hourly basis. And uh, uh, much like our graphics that we look up on the web for case counts, they're changing on a daily basis. So. If I may, we'll just to close with one more question. Uh, John, you know, you live in Oregon as I do, and we see signs in our uh, front yards uh, around our neighbors saying kids deserve a chance to go back to school. Um, we, we're not seeing, thankfully, a lot of transmission in our schools. And, and maybe I, I, in looking at the data I've read, uh, many parents are asking me what I think about their children going back to school face to face. Do the metrics that are being applied to opening up businesses and opening up, say, churches and things, uh, meeting halls, can we can we apply those necessarily to schools, especially elementary age schools? You know, for someone who's studied uh, school transmission for the last uh, uh, eight, nine years, uh, I, I don't quite understand where the evidence base is coming from. Uh, keep in mind that in the United States, uh, when this started circulating, schools were shut down uh, in mid-March. There hasn't been the usual, you know, connection with kids, there, the concentrations. Uh, I can tell you that Lake Mills uh, is now under uh, closed or shut down because 21 teachers have made complaints because of the high risk. The thing to keep in mind is not the kids who are gonna be suffering the outcomes of this. It's the adults in the family, and it's the grandparents, and it's the people who are immunocompromised. From our orchard study, we're, what we're finding now, uh, we're doing uh, household uh, studies. The rarity is when everybody in a household, if there's one case, it's rare that not well, it, the, the, the most common finding is if one person in the household is positive, everybody is. Uh, we also have evidence that the very first transmission in Oregon uh, was in a home daycare. Uh, this was on March 18th that we have the first, when there were a total of, the, 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 fir the first index case was a child 11 years old who likely contracted this at school. Uh, during a time that we didn't recognize this. So I think there's uh, kind of this false narrative out there that children don't transmit this. We know very well they do. There is a false narrative that schools are safe. Schools can be done incredibly safely, and the Oregon School District is doing it incredibly safely now. They have K through 12 in, but there's no more than 10 children in any classroom. They don't have lunchtime. The kids are either there uh, in the morning or in the afternoon, but they don't overlap. And so uh, schools can operate very carefully, but you can't open up a school, put everybody in there, uh, say you don't have to mask and distance and expect everything to go well. And I'll just rem remind people, we're in an explosive phase of this across the country. Um, you know, uh, Wisconsin, 92 people died yesterday. Across the country, it was more like 17, or 1,700 people died yesterday. Um, this is a serious, serious pandemic. This has not occurred for over 100 years, and the level to which people treat this in a cavalier manner has been really shocking to me. So uh, that, that's my own opinion, but uh, I, I just sit back and watch what uh, we as a society has been doing. Uh, and it is just really, we're, I think we're going to look back and go, what were we thinking uh, during that year? Why did we, uh, and I, I, again, I'll just um, you know, I, I keep touch, in touch with a uh, colleague of mine in, in Melbourne, Australia, uh, where they shut it down completely. And Australia, a country of 24 million people, uh, have had, uh, you know, a third of the deaths of Wisconsin. Uh, so, you know, you just have to keep everything in perspective. But this is a really serious thing. This is something I don't want to come down with. Uh, and I, I just worry. I, I watched the uh, nursing home that my mom is in, um, 29 cases and four or six deaths of residents there. And you talk about situations like that. This is going to keep on going on. Uh, 
until we get it under better control. And we don't do that until we, you know, apply what we know in terms of public health measures until such time that we have uh, vaccines that are fully deployed and people can go back to some sense of normalcy. That was, that was a lot, so I apologize. No, that's, that's fine. John, thank you. Julia, thank you. Uh, as always, uh, you both are very much appreciated in our department, and we thank you for your expertise and knowledge and the way you convey that to us, and I think help us to think about these things um, in, a, in a, I think, a, a thoughtful and evidence-based way. So thank you all. Thank you all for attending who have been here today. And uh, as Julia and Jonathan alluded to, if you have further questions uh, or thoughts that you want to uh, uh, communicate with them on, please email them. Okay. Thank you again so much for this. I think it was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh-huh. Bye-bye.